Alexis, can I have your attention? We have a unique situation tonight. Everybody gets four minutes to come up here and tell us what they think of the election until our speaker gets here. If he ever does. Election. If he doesn't get here, we'll have a discussion about where the country's going to be. Erection? What? He called. He called? Okay, he's on the way supporting We got to fill the air to the Chinese guy. It sounded like an election. Who wants to be first in the announcement or talk about the whole situation? Hello, nobody wants to. All right, I'll get it going. I don't even know who won. Why are you going to talk about the I was in Wisconsin for election day. I don't even know what happened. Well, all right, everyone had a, some time here to look over the results. I don't know if we got a blue wave or not, but we got control of the Congress. I don't know if you people follow Congress, but um, or know how it operates. Much of the thing that happens in the government of the United States originates in the House of Representatives. In particular, budget matters. All of those begin in the House, and possibly the people who run the United States government are the chairman of the committees. And no piece of legislation that the chairman or the committee and majority will ever get through Congress, through those individuals. I had a piece of legislation, and the Republicans were, ran Congress, and even the congressman called me up personally and said, the chairman will not let this legislation out of the committee. There's nothing I can do for you with, with like that. Now there's this, the new Congress takes effect on January 2nd. So uh, there's the major thing, the news is going to be on on the investigations, which has been stifled. But the other thing you want to keep an eye on is, and if you have any issues, like if you're part of an advocacy organization, this is the time to get your two cents in. Like environmentalists will want to have the, those regulations restored. The transportation community, I assure you, is already out of the game. And they want an infrastructure thing. And we're actually listening to the news. The infrastructure people have, have gotten the attention already. So the transportation community well, the rest of you were all doing all this stuff, la di da di da We've already got our issue advanced, and it's at the top of the agenda, the infrastructure legislation that Trump refused and the Republicans refused to have anything to do with. They wouldn't advance anything for improvements to public transit or any infrastructure. They, they didn't believe in that. They stifled that completely. So that's the major thing. Um, do you think in Illinois we have some reason to celebrate? Uh, we do have 18 congressional representatives and the two senators. And the delegation now is, consists of 13 Democrats and five Republicans. Now the amazing thing about the, the state is almost cut exactly in half. Uh, people are aware of this. The northern part is Democratic, and the south is completely Republican, except for the center of the top there right now. It used to be that we had um, a Democratic senator from East St. Louis area there, Costello, for many, many years, uh, who served as faithfully. No, he, unfortunately, he retired. Uh, about four years ago, and so that that district has swung back to the Republicans. So virtually, the, if you before the conversation, everything south of Chicago, the metropolitan area, is Republican. It's amazing if you see the map. I was going to post it on Facebook of Illinois, you know. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of freshmen uh, people coming in the Congress. 
Uh, I wouldn't expect a lot of change out of them. Congress is a complex endeavor, uh, especially advancing legislation, getting it written. Uh, it doesn't 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 sound like something you just sit out and do you know in half an hour or something. It and it goes through endless revisions, committee hearings, and things like that. So. These, these newly elected people may come in with a passion and an agenda, but it's not likely that we're going to see any radical change. Now, singularly, the best part of this whole thing is that the president can no longer cut and run. And there definitely is, he is guilty beyond any measure of obstruction of justice and to discredit the, the whoever heard of uh, the, the Department of Justice <coughs> the one thing that we, we're, the, we're the champion of in the world is that we have a judicial system that's held up without beyond corruption and as far as I know, and it's not been demonstrated to me, the fact that they are investigating. Now, I, I, I should add to this. I dealt for 25, 35 years, people don't realize this, I dealt with federal employees who were being investigated. I read their cases, their investigations. I represented many of them. I was investigated myself. I even had legislation in Congress regarding how the investigations are conducted because they were not being conducted when they should have, they were being conducted when they should not have, or they were being conducted improperly. And I've never seen a situation that demanded more further investigation. Some of the thing about this political involvement there's a very high standard in the Code of Ethics in the government of the United States. And that's the very image of impropriety is, is, is sufficient to get you in trouble. And to say that the Trump administration and some of those cabinet level members are so beyond that, it's unbelievable. It is just unbelievable. You don't know how stringently these things... Now, you've got things like, like here, the Hatch Act. And believe you me, man, is this applied uh, assiduously uh, to federal employees. And the other day, I've got the secretary of the, the president, she's a member of the executive staff. I was in the executive office. She actually is... is, 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 is was, putting out this video. It was, she was at a campaign rally. And she put out this video using her personal email. Now those I know, that's so much not allowed. You, once you, you cannot even, a federal employee, can't even put anything out like that, even if you disguise yourself, and, because people might know who you are or whatever. You can't even do it personally. They've written the rules that you can't do social media. And they blatantly disregard this. It's just amazing. I go, are there any standards who's applying these? You know, this is, this is like wide, wide open. Anything goes. You know, but anyhow, uh, like anybody will wait and see. I think a lot of people, but the point I'm making, and in summary, is that don't look for instantaneous change. The litigation is slow, and this is a good thing. It's better to have litigation that's slow and thorough than haphazard and with with an inappropriate motivation behind it. Uh, the Russia investigation is not suitable. And there I hear the alarm clock going off, and therefore I am quitting this. I've had it. And a boy. Hi. That was pretty much good. I hope, hey, what I, did you take notes?
Who's next? And a boy, Charlie. Yeah. Come on, one of you guys. Uh, oh, oh, All right, that Rios. First name Rios. Last name Rios. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to propose really? something. Hello. Can you hear me? Can I speak up? we got a lot of people here. Can you turn it up? I'm not going to speak up. I wouldn't put no money in the stock market. All right, this is what I'm proposing. You wouldn't put no money in the bank. Hey, guys, guys. Guys, I'll give you the mic if you want to talk. Oh, I'm sorry. So, here I am. I'm about uh, approaching 70 now, okay? And I look back, and I'm like, okay. I know that when I was a child, a toddler, all right, there's a point in time all of our lives when there's this experiment. You have a cup of water, one is a fat cup, the other is a tall cup. You take a glass, two other glasses that have the same amount of water in them. You pour one glass into the tall cup, the other glass into the short cup, and you ask the child which has more water. And every one of them says the tall cup has more water. Yeah, it does. All right? Until they turn about five. All right? <coughs> now, so you see that there's like a big change there between like three and, you know, five. Okay? Then what happens is, like, you go from being, let's say, a t you have a baby, you have a toddler, you have like, let's talk, I'm talking about food now, and with food it's like, at a baby you eat certain things. As a toddler, you have other things that you eat and things that you just don't like, all right? And then you go through puberty and you start eating like a lot of other things, and, bef and then what happens is, you go from like around 12, you go through puberty, and you go through this other change where like, you're no longer the person you were before. You're not a child, okay? And what happens to you also is, you'll eat anything on the planet, okay? You go from being a really picky eater to eating anything on the planet. And then you're a teenager, and you go through these teenage years where everything is so hard and confusing, right? And then you come to this other part in your life, <laughs> where, like, when I was 25, or under 25, I was working for a company, and I found out that, like, car companies wouldn't rent to me because I was under 25. There was a thing where you're under 25, even though, like, my employer wanted me to rent. It's like, no, we're not renting to you. Um, but then when I passed 25, when I got to be 26, I looked at myself and I said, you know, I did so many stupid things between 18 and 25 that I'm lucky I'm alive. And actually, I said, I'm not the only one. Everyone is lucky to be alive if they make it to 25. Because you do so many stupid things. All right? And then I came across this thing with uh, schizophrenia. All right? Schizophrenia happens to adults between like 18 and 25. If you pass 25, chances are you're not going to become schizophrenic. You know? But, but within that range. So I'm thinking that there must be like another organization of the mind that happens that you pass. And if you pass it at 25, you know, you're lucky. You succeeded. All right, but there's something else going on there with the mind or with yourself. It's like just physically different. And then you get into the, you know, the adult phase of your life. And then you get into the geriatric phase of your life, okay? And in that phase, what used to make me laugh and still does, is reliably every 10 years, 
there's someone who says, there's a study that goes out and asks elderly people, geriatrics, if you had to live your life over again, what would you do differently? And to a person, to a person, the geriatrics say, I would spend more time with friends and family. Okay? And I know that is a geriatric response, because that's my response today. But I also know that when I was 25, the last thing I wanted to do was spend time with family. It was like, I am out of here, okay? Now, my point. Here I am, approaching, not near, but approaching, well, approaching 70, let's say, in round numbers, okay? Coffee. And Coming right as now. I look back on my existence, I find that I have really been the very same person I have always been through all of those changes as far back as I can remember, okay? As far back as like toddler, as my earliest memories, through puberty, through teenage years, through the schizophrenia passage and the, you know, the frightening, you know? All through adulthood, now into geriatrics. As I look back on that, Jeez, I have literally always been the same, even though, logically I know, between the thing, the kid who can't tell which class has more water in it, and everything else I went through, picky eater, eat everything, uh, maturity, you know, I basically have been the same. So, I wonder, is that the soul? Is that constant that's been through all my life, the soul? And to, you know, the thing that we just can't, it's like, what is it? That, that's it. That constant through life is, okay. is the soul. You ready? The beer batter. Those are my four Potato. minutes. Thank you. Wow. Nice. <laughs> Can I bring you your diet? I no. I like it. I'm sorry. You're better looking at the potato. Right. Like our friend who just spoke, I too wondered. Hey, we're moving. I had the diet. I don't know that I have any greater profound thoughts to say about the election. I found it kind of a mixed bag. The blue wave perhaps did not materialize nationally as we would have hoped. But on the other hand, he did the, the red way. And in fact, we picked up some governorships. As Charlie noted, we took control of the House, so that means the Democrats now have oversight they can do. Mr. Trump chose to try and frighten them by saying, well, if they investigate me, that means war. And you heard what, what Nancy Pelosi told him. We're not looking for a fight, but we're not going to run for one either. Yeah. Sisterhood is powerful, isn't it? <laughs> Um, and then the big a blue wave may not have materialized nationally, but it sure did in Illinois. It blew Bruce Rauner out of office. Within an hour after the polls closed, NBC had already called the election for J.D. Pritzker. And at that point, Rauner threw in the towel. And the rest of the state took it also came in. And they were expecting a close race between them for the Attorney General. But instead, right after Rauner conceded, so did Erica Harrell. I was absolutely delighted to say the least. And so all these people were complaining about what a villain Mike Mannequin is. Well, I'm not Mannequin's biggest admirer by any means. But neither do I think that he's the demon that some people are trying to make him out to be. And maybe now we will get a governor who will work with the legislature. So that if we accomplish nothing else, we can get a state budget passed without all this angst and without having to do without a budget.
Trump appointed as acting attorney general, which he had the authority to do. Our, my attitude was to bring back Robert Kennedy. <laughs> The real danger, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, there's two things. And the first one, of course, is the atomic weaponry. And we've, uh, since 1945, we dropped two bombs on Japan, and we haven't dropped another bomb in another country, uh, in, in another country. So I think we're getting by in that to a certain degree, as far as atomic weaponry is concerned, destroying the universe, destroying the Earth. And the other problem is global warming, and global warming, there's only one real country that is really doing something about it, and that is China. It's uh, got solar panels at this particular time. They're producing more solar panels than any other, every, every other country combined. So they realize what has to be done. But China is controlled by the Communist Party. In the capitalist world, Germany was putting up a lot of solar panels, but what I understand is they went back to coal to a considerable degree. So what makes China the leader in, in, the, in producing solar panels, it doesn't um, get profit off of producing fossil fuel. In the capitalist country, a lot of their profit and their biggest profit is from oil. So it's fossil fuels that are developing, and they have no real interest in uh, developing solar panels. What they're doing, the programs that I watched on television about uh, certain cities that are uh, prone to being destroyed because of glo global warming, is in, in uh, different parts of Europe and Japan, and they had a program about New York City. And Japan is real, really bad there. They've had so much sinking going on in different parts of Japan. It seems like uh, so much uh, floods and everything. You never hear about it on the, uh, on the mass media. But they have this program about cities flooding. And they talk a lot about that. So they're in danger. New York City is in real danger. Because New York City had that big flooding a number of years ago. And the flooding oh, no. went into the tunnels, yeah. and that, it is real dangerous over there, and they're not really doing anything about it. In fact, when they had these programs on um, Channel 11, they didn't mention one word about them putting in solar panels or trying to to uh, d develop in, into a country that that uses renewable energy whether solar panels or wind power or hydropower, they never mention one word about it. And if you put on the news, all the news does is tell you that there's flooding here, there's flooding there, and therefore that's what's happening, never mention global warming. So what, what is the danger is that profits 
in the capitalist countries are, are the most important thing to the ruling class in the capitalist countries. But uh, what ha what's going to happen is you won't have a world to live in in another, let's like, say, 12 to 20 years if they don't do anything about it. So it's a, it's a class that doesn't care anything about human beings. He always used to talk about the human rights that we have in the United States. If they're willing to destroy all human life, they ought to be arrested by the government. And if they don't do anything about it, they should put in jail or not. They should indict them for genocide of the human race. And they're not doing that. The government is bought off by the capitalists of the United States and every other capitalist country. So somebody that says capitalism got a future, it doesn't have any future. And it's not willing to do anything about something that might destroy all human life. Nobody else wants to take um, four minutes? Yeah, four, five, whatever you got. 15, 20. <laughs> well, the blue wave um, did come, and um, a lot of us were scared that it was not going to happen or that it would be uh, uh, somehow stolen by the Republicans. Now, as many of you know, I um, do work with a group called Refuse Fascism. Uh, I also work with Indivisible, and uh, I'm a member of Move On. Uh, there's no cards, you know, carrying, but I'm, I'm on the Move On, you know, emergency um, uh, mobilization list. And, uh, and um, um, but I, I worked, um, I got connected through Indivisible to, because uh, I live in Hammond, uh, Indiana, to uh, the Democratic Party in Indiana. And I, went ahead with uh, doing a canvassing um, door to door that, you know, uh, grunt work, as it were, um, for the last three, three to four months. Um, and that was because um, um, I, uh, uh, rash, you know, from a rational standpoint, I mean, you have to consider that uh, what we've been living through these last two years it, at least there's a decent chance it can be mitigated by the Democrats taking over the House. And of course, there's a terrible danger between now and um, January 4th, which I understand is the day that the Democrats will um, and, you know, be able to put their majority in place legally, again, if there's no Republican interference. Um, I was hoping to save um, Donnelly um, um, for the Senate, although he's not a progressive, and I consider myself progressive as those labels go. Um, but um, he was the best we could hope for in Indiana. So on the basis of that, uh, uh, you have to make rational choices about these things. And the people that were too pure to vote for Hillary Clinton because somehow they were Sanders supporters or, or they wanted to vote Green or whatever, um, they, they really got us into this mess. Um, not necessarily um, through uh, anything inimical or, you know, but through negligence. And negligence, of course, is um, something that uh, if, you, if you negligently allow an employee to die in, in your factory, um, you're guilty. So uh, all I'm getting at is that um, I did make a decision to uh, try to help the Democrats out while continuing to work with um, a leftist group that was doing a lot of demonstrations and, and marching. And it's pretty much worn me out. And it, it, there was, um, I went to that, that uh, uh, rally in March on um, uh, Thursday night. I also went to the Refuse Fascism press conference and rally on Wednesday. And the, this is the one earlier today. So um, you can understand, does anyone want their, Next minute or two, you can understand why um, I got sick yesterday and I was throwing up and I don't know what, I just felt terrible. It was probably a reaction to all of the time I put in and the lack of sleep. 
Um, but what I am getting at is that um, even though we are lucky enough that it looks now like we had enough of a democratic pushback against these horrible Republicans that have sold their souls to fascism and authoritarianism and uh, total uh, giving up all the norms of decent, civilized behavior, um, and many of them just being fine with supporting an outright fascist regime. Um, even though it looks like um, there's a possibility that the Democrats, when they take power, if they have information through Mueller's investigation or investigations that they put on themselves, will be able to somehow uh, force Trump to be um, uh, bridled instead of unbridled, or um, get an impeachment um, uh, into the Senate that Republicans buy into because they're so, you know, that they're maybe horrified that the polls are going against them so much. We don't know when, when that's going to happen, and we'll still have to deal with Pence if, if it does happen, that somehow Trump's going really. So it's still a dire circumstance for our country. Um, I don't. Uh, uh, I have a bunch of friends in, in the group I'm with that are always hair on fire and screaming. And everything. How would you define fascism? Well, um, you know, there's various um, properties that. Uh, what we have here is a, a, a capitalist type of fascism where there's a cooperation of capitalism in its unbridled sense, you know. It's the libertarianism, but it's it's uh, allied with the government, government capitalism, uh, especially the way it uh, uh, is, you know, putting the poor in their place, you know, by giving tax breaks to the, to the wealthy and doing the, the will of billionaires. It's a kind of corporate fascism. Then there's the fascism that um, is trying to uh, control uh, the public access to information and trying to control the free press. And the founders of this country um, knew that uh, a free press was absolutely necessary. I don't know if the term was used at the time for the state. I don't uh, I'd have to look that up. But um, they knew that it was very important. There had to be an educated public and that that public had to be willing to uh, uh, push back against any attempt at despotism. They just got rid of what they considered to be a despot in uh, George III, and um, what they would have called a tyranny. Um, and we, uh, we know that one of the um, criteria of a fascist uh, regime is that they want to control a free press. They want to beat down the public's ability to access information and make um, educated judgments about what the, their government is doing. And we saw that happen in all the totalitarian regimes, basically, um, including Hitler's, Mussolini's, Stalin's, Mao Zedong's. Um, and here we see it in a budding form. I mean, it is a, it is a kind of fascism that was growing. Here, I use up another four minutes. Yeah, keep going. Nobody keep wants going. to. <laughs> this is, it's job. hard to hard to keep going without prepared yeah. remarks uh, this way. But um, fascism also um, denigrates the other. Uh, in other words, um, Hitler had uh, the Jews that he uses scapegoats. Um, he in, in, incited his public, uh, his rabid followers, uh, to go along with, uh, if not the uh, extermination of the Jews, at least the vilification of them, beating them up, uh, uh, breaking their windows and stealing their property and, and hurting them off. Obviously, they were sent away somewhere and all good Germans were like, oh, we don't know where they went. I mean, we couldn't investigate it because there was no free press, I guess. <laughs> Nobody was reporting, hey, Dachau, here's the conditions here. You know, at least we have a, a press that's free enough that they're reporting on the conditions at the border where children were uh, separated from their parents, denied the right that they legitimately have under international law to apply for asylum, and the norms of what asylum legitimately entails 
in a country that has human decency, at least, and realizes that um, there are people that are fleeing oppression, people that are fleeing uh, situations where their lives are, are threatened um, in such severe conditions, like in Honduras, which is what a lot of these people are coming from Honduras, a, a country that we caused a lot of the uh, chaos that's going on there. So I'm rambling a little bit, um, maybe, but, but um, speaker, the speaker here? No. Another four minutes. I'll be right. Okay. Someone else wants. It's fine. If you can think of any other uh, criteria of, of um, fascism, uh, just go ahead and uh, bring that up. I think I've made a good case that um, we could consider this uh, group of hoodlums or gangsters, or you could get another whole bunch of names to them. Um, uh, you know that Trump is defying the rule of law, that's another thing that fascists do, they're laws to themselves. I mean, appointing a flunky that is not only a criminal fraudster, but also has just said that he'll go along with anything the executive does when he's supposed to be upholding justice as attorney general or acting attorney general and doing it illegitimately, I mean, that's a, that is a, another um, facet of fascism, that kind of thing. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, finish now. I don't do this often, and I'm sorry Tim isn't here tonight because I really wanted to talk about the trickle-down effect of tariffs, but um, I'll save that for another time. But the one thing that has been going around in my blogs that I enjoy very much is a quote by H.L. Mencken back in the 20s, I believe, who said, on some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. And that's all I do. All right. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, things. What's that? If those for those of you that like to read, if you can only afford one book a year, this would be my recommendation. This is the 2019 edition of Censored News from Project Censored out of Sonoma State. This book this year is dedicated to helping people discern the difference between fake news and real news. Also, it contains uh, stories. The number one threat against America now is uh, the U.S. military says is climate change. It's not terrorism. There is no terrorist threat against the United States. And that knowledge is spreading that our military, their activity in Afghanistan, Iraq, everything, all the oil rich companies, that is driven by the myth of 9-11. And the rest of the world is supporting it. Uh, several other countries are getting ready to dump on the internet all the forensic evidence of the criminal activity of 9-11 which was seven buildings destroyed by a demolition company. They filmed the first two and told us we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims. So we puncture that myth, bring the troops home from everywhere, and let them start working in America. Now, those of you, you got a question, Charlie? Yeah, how many people are on this demolition uh, An unknown number, Charlie, but we saw the results. The other thing is I'd like to mention, what? What kind of explosive is there? Well, uh, the explosive expert thinks that there were some shape charged mini nukes in the basement of this tower that vaporized it all the way up. That's the latest theory. But all you have to know is that it wasn't done by a plane crash. They've been building, building shape charged small nuclear weapons since 1980. It's like uh, they, they were called neutron weapons back then. They they would uh, you know get rid of the buildings with intense heat, but uh, you know, or, people. They, they have all kinds of esoteric nuclear weapons. Seven buildings were destroyed that day. The satellite photos showed and the ground pictures showed. Using nuclear weapons? No. We don't know. We don't know about all the buildings, but what we do know is they were all destroyed. So you have to move away from the category where you think the two towers were destroyed. One last question. You've had 20, 15, 20 years, and that's the amount of detail. Oh. Uh, Charlie, I, I would answer your question by saying, look at how long they were able to cover up the pedophile priest problem. 
Look at how long they covered up the hazards of asbestos after it was solidly known. The billionaire press has the ability to suppress and to keep knowledge in the dark if that knowledge would cut into their profits. Now, one last thing. Everybody's talking about maybe the blue wave didn't materialize. That, that, that's the press saying that the blue wave wasn't as big as what they thought. It was as bigger, bigger. It was a monster wave, and it overwhelmed the vote suppression tactics of Republican criminals in 30 states that were just shoveling Democratic votes into a trash can. There was, this was the most corrupt election in the entire history of the United States with voter suppression going on all over the place. But an army of young people led by groups like Sunrise and some others that the media has been blacking out, they were raising the invisible army that finally showed up on election day and voted all these women progressives into office and shocked a few corporate criminals that thought their safe their uh, their, their, their safe seats were in uh, the House of Representatives. They thought they had safe seats. They were gerrymandered in districts and uh, the blue wave of voters. Young voters were the largest voting bloc this time. They beat out the baby voters. And so uh, the future belongs to the young and they're mobilizing in Europe and everywhere else saying, we have no future. What are we doing in school? We got 12 years. We need now 2030. Now we got 12 years to get a massive mobilization on climate change, or it's over. Because the latest report shows that the computer checksums about the ice melting was wrong. They thought it was happening farther in the future. It's happening faster at both poles, and the methane is beginning to melt in the permafrost. The oceans, uh, the methane that's trapped, been trapped for millions of years, that bubbles up into the atmosphere and melts is 20 to 50 times worse than our current carbon dioxide. So, Did you say the methane has started to melt? Yeah, the methane and the permafrost in Siberia and the methane trapped under uh, water in the oceans, as the oceans get warmer, uh, it's just a tipping point. In the, in the Arctic, they say they got pictures, methane is just bubbling up in the ocean, uh, open, open water in the Arctic up near the North Pole. So, uh, along with the U.S. military and uh, probably 99% of all other independent climate, uh, independent science, like the Academy of Sciences, they're all saying the same thing now. We gotta mobilize, get moving, and as I said last week, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. That one book, you can get it on disc, you know, books on tape at the library. Listen to it, it's easier than reading it. Trust me, there's 17 discs. It's the best education hour by hour that you're going to get on climate change. So um, with that said, uh, let's kick off the program. Right there. You can wait. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Come on up. Yeah. Well, we should have new guys. Yeah, we're going to talk about yeah, no. this. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. I'm young and the future belongs to me and I am a libertarian. <laughs> Libertarian Party failed to get 5% by any statewide candidate. I blame this on the Sam McCann campaign, which was a controlled opposition funded by Madding and Allies. Uh, however, we did uh, achieve ballot access in a few counties, McLean, Kankakee, and Perry. That will make it easier for folks to run as Libertarians on the ballot in those places. I was a writing candidate for the Illinois House in the 4th District. I'd be lucky if I got one other writing vote other than myself, as I spent more time uh, campaigning on behalf of the statewide ticket. Um, but now, uh, I got all the free time in the world, so I'm, gonna, I'm running for uh, City Council. Is there anybody here in the 4th Ward? Joe Moreno's Ward? All right. Cool. Uh, if you want to help me petition, I'll be at Starbucks uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. The middle of Starbucks at Milwaukee and Damon, right off uh, the Damon Blue Line stop. Uh, also, fascism is not synonymous with libertarianism. Uh, libertarianism is opposed to fascism and other forms of authoritarianism. Capitalism, as defined as voluntary exchange, cooperation, and private property rights, is not what uh, we have here in America. Uh, but the status quo does have properties of authoritarianism, which I'll, I guess, grant you. And also, 7-Eleven is a part-time job. So, look into it. Thank you.
Okay, welcome everybody to the College of Complexes. Our speaker is here and ready to go. What about the rules announcements? about the rules? The rules of the college are two. One full at a time speaks and no insults. Um, try to try no personal insults or attacks. Try to keep it civil. And one full at a time. Let's not just think, let it go off the rails tonight. Let's try to uh, give our speaker some respect. He's old enough to deserve it. Okay. That was pretty good. Oh, what about announcements? Thank you all. What about announcements? Well, uh, why did we follow the I format? I couldn't wait. Well, because because announce, are there any announcements? Well, the people could have made Are there any announcements? Well, you got yeah. one. Nobody yeah. else does, apparently. They already made them when they were talking. We didn't have any group for announcements. Please follow the format. It's very simple. This is meeting, um, what are we? <laughs> meeting 3,502. Uh, let's see, regarding announcements, um, there'll be a meeting on Wednesday if you're opposed to the transportation of nuclear waste through the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, as well as uh, petroleum tank car trains. That'll be on Wednesday at 6.30. It's a free event at the offices of the Nuclear Energy Information Service. If anybody's interested, please uh, give me 3411 West Diversity. If anybody's interested, I have flyers, there's more flyers in the back with all the details of the event. Let's see what else. Uh, by the way, since we're at it, on the page three of the Thing. We have uh, several formats where you can learn about upcoming events and other programs. I highly recommend the Yahoo group and, or the, and, and or the Meetup group. And you'll get one, possibly two uh, announcements about upcoming programs. It's easy to sign up. Just finish a, 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 an email. Uh, we booked up to January. And Doug Blinkley, you're going to take January 12th? You have me. <coughs> what? You have me. All right. So the next open date will be the 19th uh, or the 26th of January. If you'd like to speak or know of an organization that we should invite, please let me know. Uh, let's see. We're also going to have a fun program on the 24th. Tim isn't here, but we're going to have our annual debate. Um, I'm going to, Tim is going to argue that uh, uh, capitalist productivity will result in prosperity for all, and I'm going to be arguing that Christmas, celebrating Christmas, will result in our extinction. I'm bugged. Um, Let's see, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for next week's program. Uh, Professor Bob Lichtenberg will be coming back. He's the author of a book on making meaning, and he's a, a patron of the arts, and particularly uh, painting and sculpture. Nevertheless, he's going to be talking about interpreting art, which I know you guys, some of you might have some difficulty doing. So it might prove worthwhile for some of you to be here. But uh, we are surrounded by art in our daily lives. And uh, so look forward to seeing you next week. OK, thank you very much. And our boy, Charlie. Geez, I wonder what's the meaning of that painting. It was kind of you all to wait for me. I apologize for my lateness. I only had three catastrophes on my way here. See, one of them was, uh, my memory is going, I'm uh, having a hard time remembering my catastrophe. Uh, the big catastrophe was, I lost my baby. 
namely the notes for my speech, which took, took two days. Oh. Uh, oh. And then when I got to the L station, uh, there were no southbound trains from Granville. So I had to go right. back to Howard. Right. I chose to take the Broadway bus. Anyhow, and I forget the third day of train. I want to focus on some omens or an, an omen. I want to focus on an omen from God, which we got this week. Uh, it relates to global warming, but I'm not going to talk about the technical details of global warming. I'm going to talk about the spiritual meaning, the psychological response, or lack thereof. Does anyone have a, a, a guess or a nomination for the greatest omen that God has sent us in a long time? It happened just this week. I'll tell you. Five, and they're going to put this in terms of the headline that the press failed to utilize, even though this headline is entirely factual. I, would, I made my living as a headline writer. I wrote some pretty good ones. This is my triumph. Here's the headline. Five middle-class white Americans roasted alive in their cars. Bingo! Ah! When I first contemplated that, I was shaking with fear, terror, dismay. Um, and there are some terrible irony. This is a terrible uh, omen from God. And we have live martyrs, you might say. Um, and the greatest irony is they were roasted to death in the, exactly the kind of vehicle that caused the problem of the huge fires in California. Global warming has, uh, what is the previous speaker's name? Uh, the guy who knows everything. I forgot his name. Andy. Yeah. He was pointing out the global warming had been increasing. And this was manifested in uh, <coughs> the heating up of the planet, drying out the greatest uh, tinder pile in the history of the North American continent. There was bound to be a forest fire sooner or later, even if it was set almost on purpose by a, a campus or something, or by carelessness. And once it got started, it was the greatest forest fire known to history. I don't know what was happening when the dinosaurs were around. <coughs> and the ironic God who rules us chose to sacrifice five people of relative innocence in order to send us a warning. <coughs> I think I'm going to start a foundation in the name of those five guys. And even though they were, they were driving cars and cars and trucks and construction equipment are among the major causes of global warming, um, I, I'm praying to God that he had mercy on their souls. They, they are not really the guilty ones. They've been very careless. And I'll tell you more about that. Um, another irony is that um, in America, of course, we place tremendous emphasis. We belong placed since, since the pioneers uh, has been considered part of the American dream to have your own home. <laughs> and the home has been valued. Uh, there was an, uh, a book or an article written in 1840 which uh, said that the man goes out to earn a living and he has a tough time and he comes back to the angel of the heart, his wife, in the home. And there is where his soul is refreshed 
And that idea has been you're very strong in America. Uh, the French have a, a strong for the home. Uh, what is the French term? I forgot what it was. The, uh, anyway. Um, but something new has happened in the American mind uh, in the last uh, century. Gradually, gradually, gradually. What has happened is that the car, the automobile, has become the second home. You have an argument with your spouse, and you don't want to go up too far with it, and you want to cool off. Where do you go? You go to your car. You take a ride in your car. The car becomes a refuge from conflict, even a refuge from conflict in the home. So these five guys are in their refuges, and that's where they get roasted alive, roasted alive. I, uh, I care about those five guys. And I care about the message. Um, um, I wish I could read my writing. <laughs> um, all right, in their cars, okay. The omen is being ignored. The press did not use a headline like mine. <laughs> no one here could, could report what the omen from God was. God is being ignored. God is being ignored. I, I, I feel like I'm a fundamentalist <laughs> Christian. My concept of God is a little bit different, a good deal different <clears throat> than the fundamentalist Christians. And as it happens, the fundamentalist Christians are agents of the Antichrist, and I can tell you about him sometime. He operates in me, too, in all of us. Um, so, I, I, in the notes that I wrote, I had written a prayer to God. Let me see if I can reconstruct it. Dear God, have mercy on the soul of these five, basically innocent men. Um, they did not intend to cause the destruction of the human race. Participating in it, they were conditioned, brainwashed by our culture to participate in the final genocide. The final genocide. Now it's true that in driving to work, what you have to do is to put food on the table for the kids and everybody. They had a drive to work, most probably. Uh, I don't know where those guys live. I haven't done that research yet. There was probably no one who lived, you know, in Rogers Park and was able to take the Outer Drive Express bus to a job in the loop. So you can't blame them for using a car, most likely. But I'm willing to bet you that not one single one of those guys ever bethought himself to say, Thank you. Well, not only that I could save uh, uh, gasoline, I could save money if I created a carpool. Now, it might take a bit of work to do it. Um, it might be very difficult. I doubt that they even thought of it. Oh, miss, could you bring me a glass of water, please? Oh, thank you. Sure. <laughs> So the problem of global warming is not a problem of whether or not you believe science. Thank you. The scientists have tried. The Pope has tried. Nothing is, is really working. And I'll give you the prime example of how we are being deceived. Barack Obama whom a lot of people thought was uh, some kind of a progressive and a concern with global warming. By executive order, I don't know in what year this was, but my te technological consultant told me about it. His name is Walter Essler, if you have ever run into him. He is absolutely a mine of technological information. Barack Obama issued 
uh, an executive order, which he's been claimed to do by certain laws that were passed, ordering a very thoroughgoing reconfiguring of the national electrical grid. And that sounds, you know, this is like electrician's work. What, 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 what is the meaning of this? It has a very deep meaning. The meaning is this. If you have any kind of power source in any area that is significant to turn out a lot of power, you've got to have the heavy electrical connections to bear that power. And then as the power gets distributed, uh, the, um, I don't, I, I don't know the technical stuff, I was going to say the resistance is less or something. The electricity can flow over uh, narrower cables and less insulation or whatever. So you have to configure the um, electrical grid to the power source. If you have a coal burning a power plant, a nuclear, or a solar, or wind, or whatever, the cables that bring the power directly have to, as a matter of fact, I forgot something else the Walter told me. Even you done with the bread, huh? The present power grid is not very effective. The, uh, the cables get too hot. They have to shut, in many cases, they have to shut down the power source to let the cables cool off. So part of Barack Obama's goal, I'm sure, was to improve those cable connections. But guess what he did? He improved the cable connections, and he concentrated more cable connections on nuclear, coal, oil, and gas. Solar and wind are left out in the cold. Uh, Arizona is not given a major connection, even though it's uh, our, our great, greatest source of solar power. And so it goes. Barack Obama, and the amazing thing is that my friend Walter, I, unfortunately I don't have the uh, exact um, documentation. Barack Obama is quoted in the New York Times, maybe a couple of years ago, as having said that the global warming uh, concerned people are bothering him a lot, and he has to do some things or say some things to get their vote. Barack Obama, either he does not believe in global warming, or he is so concerned to get uh, enough votes for his candidates and enough uh, money to satisfy him. <coughs> There's no amount of money that will satisfy, satisfy capitalists. Uh, that he is manipulating people. He is a worse enemy than um, Donald Trump for the very for the very reason that with Trump you know you see what you get you get what you see. Uh, Barack Obama has fooled the American people into thinking something is being done about global warming. Yes, something is being done about it. It's being made worse. And I'll tell you one more thing about uh, Donald Trump. It's not that he's a wonderful guy, but he has. Uh, he, he has uh, uh, tripped into the, the major um, reduction of, of, of carbon emissions, the biggest reduction in carbon emissions that we've ever had. Guess, guess what produced that? His trade war, or wars, what the trade wars have been doing is to cut down on international trade, which means there are fewer freighters crossing the oceans. There's a, a area in the Pacific where um, they, 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 uh, they put freighters in cold storage in the warm Pacific. And they're floating out in the ocean, and there's probably a few guys tending to them. More freighters are out of commission than at any time since World War II, which means an enormous drop in carbon emissions. It doesn't mean I'm going to vote for Trump, but what it proves is that in the problem of global warming, it's difficult to see what is really going on. But on top of that, 
the American people have been brainwashed. The smartest millionaire in America, Warren Buffett, who made his he made just about all of his billions and he increased them and he kept up kept kept, kept, kept them going. Unlike our president, who lost 20% of the money his father gave him, and he claims to be a great capitalist, Warren Buffett deserves about a million times more respect than Donald Trump has said that global warming, in so many words, he said this a number of times, the global warming is a greater threat to America than was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I think he first said this about a half a dozen years ago. No noticeable impact. Whoops. The slanting table is not a good place to put a glass of water. Um, so uh, Warren Buffett gave us the diagnosis in a very neat form, dramatic form. You know, if the doctor comes and says, do you have any atrophic lateral sclerosis, what the hell is that? If the doctor says, you're getting paralyzed more and more, or whatever it is, and uh, Warren Buffett uh, re referred to one of the greatest uh, tragedies in American history, the attack on the Harbor. Doesn't have much effect. Now, peculiarly enough, about six years before Warren Buffett made that statement, uh, the diagnosis. I came up with the cure. I, I, what I didn't have was a real neat <laughs> turn of phrase. The greatest threat since Pearl Harbor, well, well, greater threat than Pearl Harbor. I was the Green Party candidate for Congress in 2008. Uh, the Green Party ticket for Congress uh, running against Jan Schakowsky in the 9th District. I got 3,990 votes. Jan Schakowsky got 190,000 votes. But my voters were smarter than her, her voters. Uh, but Jan Schakowsky had a good sense of humor. I ran into her a year later at a meeting, and I said I apologize to her for failing to uh, have called uh, after the election to congratulate her on her victory, and she said, yeah, I was waiting for your call. <laughs> um, so what I did in my two minutes on Channel 11 as a candidate, I don't know, is Channel 11 still doing that? Offering two free minutes to every candidate on the ballot? Nobody knows. Okay. What I did was I just copied Franklin Delano Roosevelt's plan for not only winning World War, uh, two, but making sure our casualties were low. <coughs> As Roosevelt said, we wa he wanted to build the greatest war machine in history so that our firepower would overwhelm the enemy and they would not have a chance to kill many Americans. <laughs> and uh, that worked out pretty well. Uh, there was a miracle that occurred. I didn't use that term when I was on television, but I see it clearly now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a recently converted atheist, as you might be able to tell. Um, where, where was I? Uh, <laughs> a miracle. Yeah, uh, the miracle. From 1937 to 1941, the conservative Southern Democrats and virtually all of the Northern Republicans got, finally got together stop the New Deal in its tracks. Now, the New Deal had accomplished a lot uh, from the introduction of Roosevelt, from the inauguration of Roosevelt in March of 33 until 37. I won't go into the details of the political ins and outs that caused this. So from 37 to 41, we had a chorus in Washington of Southern Democrats and the Northern Republicans and, their, and their, their chant was, we're broke, we're broke, we're broke. The country was broke. After all, the country had a $5 billion deficit, that uh, the national debt. It seemed very huge. That was the biggest they ever had before. 
Um, but it, um, the country is broken. You can't do anything more. Suddenly, the lights entered their brains along with the Japanese bombs on Pearl Harbor. The broke country was able to mount uh, a industrial mobilization. The cost during World War II, the cost was $350 billion, which that was real money that they were talking about then. And it, just, it, trans, it translates into, in 2018 dollars, translates uh, into about seven trillion. They must have discovered the money in, in the, in the, under the cushions of the, the country in, the, in, in the, the congressional building. Um, so the money can be found. So what I advocated, well, that was a miracle that the Republicans woke up, a miracle that was uh, brought to them by Seiji Yamamoto, the guy who organized the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. And I'm sure a lot of you know uh, Admiral Yamamoto, who's famous for having said, we have awakened a sleeping oh. <laughs> Yamamoto's way of saying, America can find trillions of dollars in resources whenever it wants to. And I helped. In 1941 and 42, I helped. Uh, I went door to door selling war bond stamp booklets. Some of you may recall, uh, if, you, if you bought a war bond for 1875, it would mature to $25 in 10 years. I calculated that's a good rate of interest. I was selling these little booklets with stamps. If you put enough stamps in there, you had 1875, you turn in and you get a war bond. So I helped to finance the war. They also collected scrap metal paper and so forth and so on. I, I didn't have a big regard. Uh, I had a good place to do it. was wonderful to work with. Um, so, what I said in my two minutes, let's do what we did in World War II. Let's um, uh, re re rejigger the national uh, industrial uh, potential, except this time, instead of producing guns, tanks, uh, planes, and, uh, and bandages, boots, let's produce solar and wind and geothermal power equipment to the tune of a, a mere seven billion dollars. If my plan had been initiated shortly thereafter, in 2009, we'd be home free from something else. There would be no jobless in America. Not a single jobless person. No one willing to work would be unable to find a job. And it would pay as well. Because that's what happened in 1942 when, um, when the Japanese Empire attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th. Unemployment was at 10.5%. Nine months later, it was at 1% which means absolute full employment. Okay, give me a minute. Because the 1% represents people changing jobs, taking off to take care of a sick relative, uh, deciding to take off uh, six months uh, for uh, an extended vacation in Hawaii or whatever. Full employment. No one uh, who wanted to work was unable to find a job. It's a pretty damn good job. Uh, Studs Turkle, in one of his books, reports about uh, Peggy Terry. Anyone here ever know her? She was a, a radical activist on the mid-north side. I, I knew her. Her husband was Gil Terry, a communist who served some time in the, in the pen. He was out at the time that I knew them. Gil Terry? Gil Terry, yeah. I used to know him. Oh, he you used did. to hang out on his, <coughs> at the door on the door. Broadway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, and I also knew his wife, Peggy. Yeah, I knew her too. Uh, I, had, I had some dealing with the guilt area. So, uh, Sled Circle tells that uh, Peggy Terry 
was uh, living in Tulsa, Oklahoma on December the 6th and so forth. And she often didn't have the money for a bus ride across town. And then after the war and the industrial mobilization got started, she heard about a job in eastern Kentucky, a war plan job, that uh, paid $30 a week. Well, that already seemed like a fortune to her. She managed to get to eastern Kentucky. And they hired her apprentice. And then after a while there, she heard about a, a, a job in a war plant up in Detroit paying $90 a week. She thought she was going to become the queen of Sheba. That's my uh, attempt at humor. Um, and she went there. And that's typical of what happened to America. By 1944, the statistics show that America was healthier and better, healthier aside from the guys who were getting shot up in the war. Uh, but uh, and on the home, we were better fed than ever, ever before. And the guys in the Army were, of course, getting three square meals a day. And, it was very difficult to avoid finding a good paying job. That would have been the result of my, no, I'm sorry, not my plan. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Pentagon. Wrote, on December the 8th, Roosevelt not only made the speech saying the state of war exists between the Empire of Japan and the United States, he started having conferences with the Pentagon. He appointed uh, of, the, of the, uh, war production. I remember the name Donald Nelson was one of them. And they planned out this most massive investment plan since the pyramids in terms of the percentage of the uh, economy. They raised uh, with the uh, war bonds sold to the people. Uh, they raised about 140 million. And then with other kinds of borrowing, like from banks, they raised uh, uh, some about 190 or 200 million. Uh, and also, we had noticed, on the one hand, the corporate income tax was 91% of profits. As the corporations were very really happy. They were making more profits than they ever had before with all these tremendous government contracts. Everybody was a winner. It wasn't a situation where if somebody wins, someone has to lose. Everybody was a winner. Of course, except the guys who were getting killed uh, in, uh, in the Pacific and the European theater. That's what would have happened. And people are saying, oh, uh, if you try to do something about global warming, it's going to cost jobs, wreck the economy. Just the opposite. But here's the big problem. Nobody listened to that loudmouth Mo Champion. Why should they listen to me? They wouldn't even listen to Warren Buffett, one of the smartest, uh, richest people in America. <laughs> when I, I, I didn't run a very good campaign. I won't go into the details of how I could do it better. because you can see, I'm an old cripple. Uh, there's not much of an excuse. Um, after the campaign was, shortly after the campaign was over, oh yeah, in the WTTW studio, when I finished my two-minute speech, the cameraman said that I had a very good plan and he would vote for me. There was one vote. And then after, a couple of days after that, um, um, my campaign manager, Walter Esler, uh, got a call from a woman I think in Wilmette who expressed strong interest in it. It either his failure or my failure to go after her. But even better than that, we could have gone into, there were precincts where I got 15, 60 votes. If I'd gone into those precincts, I could have organized those people. I, I don't think I even thought of it. So I was lame. The American people were even more lame. They didn't know how to even contemplate the, the, the word emergency is hardly adequate, and the opportunity to have a tremendously, not only a prosperous economy, but a united people. Uh, in World War II, we not only reached a peak of 
economic uh, production and uh, military victory, we had just the opposite of what we have now, a unified country. And I remember that unity. I was part of it. As I said, I was selling war stamps. I just, I just fell right in. Um, it isn't only that there was rationing, that you could only consume so much sugar or, uh, or gasoline. Does anyone remember the ABC rule of gas rationing stickers on your windows? You had an A sticker that probably meant you were a doctor or a policeman or whatever, and you got the maximum share of gasoline. But the consumption of gasoline went way, way down. And when I run for mayor, I'm going to advocate that plan uh, in, in Chicago. Well, no, it won't work just in Chicago. i got some other plans. Um, we were unified. Nobody had to tell people to uh, conserve uh, gasoline or clothing. The government took the, um, the cups off men's pants. You couldn't produce pants with cups on them. And I think that introduced a style which still continues in certain lines, certain fashion lines. My, my mother, who had started cooking a chicken every Friday night back in the Ukraine, was accumulating, as usual, a fair amount of schmaltz. Does anyone know what schmaltz is? Chicken fat. Chicken fat. In and Yiddish. Also, uh, since schmaltz is used to sort of uh, spur up the, uh, the flavor of, of various foods, the Jewish comedians and children began to use the term schmaltz to mean something to schmaltz up the act. To make it more tasty or appealing or funny. Well, my mother had been using most of the schmaltz to prepare other dishes. But when you boil a chicken, I was just got used to being boiled a chicken, not fried chicken. When you boil a chicken, you get a lot of fat. So she would accumulate the fat in a can. And she took the can to her butcher. The butcher got it to the government to use it to manufacture explosives. Now, nobody told my mother she had to do that. There was no law. She did it. Everybody was doing things for the country. People were not motivated only by uh, a profit motive, self-interest. There was a common effort. And of course, it reaches its peak in what the Germans called the socialism of the trenches. The trenches you may wonder how and why guys risk their lives so much. A lot of guys at the battle them. They're risking their lives for their buddies. But they, that's the greatest love affair in American history, the love affair of soldiers for each other. Well, there was this unity. We have lost it. We have really lost it. But we need to find a means of, of including the brainwashing out of our heads. The brainwashing that says, it's the brainwashing that led to this disunity, the brainwashing that says, the only thing that you have to be concerned about in life is your profit margin, or what, whatever terms you want to put it. Uh, the founding fathers said that the republic could not function unless there were public-spirited citizens who were not only interested in their uh, profit margin. So we have this society is being torn apart by people concentrating on their profit margin. And it started before tr uh, Trump. So well, then the question is, what can, the real problem is not all the, we've got to believe the scientists about global warming. Uh, why should anyone want to, uh, in his view, pauperize himself by supporting what he thinks is a global warming solution? And the focus of attention is just to the office. Um, so what is needed? is a new human unity, and I have the plans for that, and I will achieve it through bribery. 
How many minutes do I have left? Five minutes. All right, I'll squeeze it in five minutes. It's real simple. The government will offer bribes, rewards, to precinct groups that cut their energy consumption, their, uh, their uh, water consumption, uh, those two, gas energy or electricity. <laughs> to any, any, any noticeable extent. <laughs> Precinct right. as a group uh, and as individuals would be able to make a, a fair amount of money without really devoting much, much time to it. But they would have to meet together to exchange ideas about how to conserve energy. And even more important than conserving the energy, it would create a local community of Trumpites, Bernie supporters, what have you. They would be focusing on a practical matter, and maybe they would get to know each other as human beings. They would say, and in addition, in addition to that, by investing themselves with their neighbors, they would become, begin to um, see global oh, warming as their, like their pet that they want to take care of. And when the corporations start doing bad things, they'll be more angry because the corporations are violating what this basic human group is trying to do. Um, in addition to that, it would provide a <coughs> person in a, in a precinct that has 400 voters that you seldom can meet all at the same time. You'd have to find an auditorium in a church that might be a mile away, but they could hold uh, uh, coffee, coffee hours and uh, smaller meetings of 50 or 100 people. And it would be a marvelous venue for political discussion. Face to face, without any interruption by all of these liars on the internet, these various uh, deceptions that, that are uh, separating people. Well, I could go on, but I don't think I have any more time. Uh, I'm contemplating a run for mayor and advocating the system of bringing millions of dollars to the people of Chicago, even before we start splitting up the TIF fund, which is uh, a, a travesty. But I uh, get my time up? Yes. Okay. I'd like to thank you all. And uh, I, I guess I can take questions. Uh, Any questions? Go. At the beginning, you spoke of an omen. You related an event. You said it's an. I, I spoke of what? An omen. Ah. You relayed an event where five men were killed in their car in the fire. Don't say killed. Roasted alive. Well, whatever. An omen has a message. You never told us what the message of your omen is. Oh, what is the message? I thought it was obvious. God is saying to us, look out for global warming. It's going to get you. Look out for global warming. It's going to get you. Like you got these guys. It's a horrible example. I said, the same, God has the same motivation that the British propagandists had in World War one when they claimed that the German army occupying Belgium was uh, cutting off people's hands and doing all kinds of horrible things, which were later proved to be false. But that wakes people up and makes them think that they have to do something or they have to avoid something. And that's the, that's the value of an omen. Any others? Yes. Now you look at this global warming like this is something that we can actually Could you talk control. louder? You suggest that this global warming issue is something that we can control, and possibly there are things that we could do to modify it, but in the 
the history of our world, um, we basically have a spinning globe that's like a top that kind of wombles back and forth with the poles changing and, and that cycles of freezing and heating are pretty normal. We just don't happen to like being here at this particular time, but this is something that's been going on for millions of years. Billions. So the question basically is global warming and cooling are natural cycles and this one is no different. Of Mother Nature, yes. Okay. Let's accept that. It's true. What you say is true. Now, if you're living, uh, if you're living uh, at the bottom of a hill, or if you have a town at the bottom of a hill, and there's the hill is starting, the rain is starting to wash the earth into a landslide. Do you say, well, that's natural, we'll have to, the town will have to be destroyed. Or maybe you do something about it. Maybe you build a dam. Maybe, well, maybe, you, build, maybe you build a dam. If, global, if, if, if Mother Nature is giving us uh, an increase in heat, why do we want to supplement it and increase it with all of this carbon? There is absolutely no question that's been known to science since about 1875 that the more carbon you put in that plus uh, that, uh, that other stuff uh, that the guy mentioned, um, the more of that stuff you put into the atmosphere, the more heat you're going to get. So, you know, if someone like, if someone was trying to rape a woman, do I want to go and help the guy to rape her, or do I want to some, do something about it? Which side am I on? We go Kavanaugh, we go. Yeah. <laughs> Three bagger. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you need to follow up on that? Yes. <laughs> Charlie. Oh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about you know if we can't do anything. If you don't need a follow up, Charlie. Yes, Mo. If transportation is the major cause of greenhouse gas production, with 98 percent of it using fossil fuels, why do you advocate doing something that has no relevance to transportation? And also, the government of the United States is running a serious serious deficit to the point they're going to cut Medicare and Social Security and you're advocating that the government go further in debt? Alright, let's take one thing at a time. Uh, what was your first question again? Why are you oh, not dealing with transportation if that, according to everyone who knows about you know why I'm not dealing with transportation much in this I'll tell you why I'm not dealing with transportation <gasps> much in this speech because I leave it to you you're our transportation expert but I never did say that transportation was the major cause of, uh, of, of carbon emissions I, I really don't know the statistics it there's, is uh, there's uh, a coal coal burning uh, no uh, it's more uh, than uh, coal. all right I didn't interrupt you okay um, well, you're in the All right, you want to talk some more? I'll wait until we're finished, and then I'll talk. All right, I'm, I'm assuming you're well, I'm sorry to offend you. You're not offending me. You're, you're, you're talking. You have the right to talk, and I, have a, I want to respect your right to talk. Except for Charlie. Okay, now, I don't know the percentage of uh, carbon that comes from transportation. Uh, one of my... One of the things I'm going to advocate, I didn't have time to advocate everything, one of the things I want to advocate uh, in my, my mayoral campaign is a law that won't cost any money, in fact it will make money, but it will cut, not only cut uh, okay. carbon emissions in Chicago, it will lighten up the traffic, which has gotten horrendous. What is the law that I want to pass? Very simple. During the rush hour, uh, on all the expressways, maybe from uh, 6 in the morning until uh, 9.30 or something, um, every car has to have one passenger. And to be on the expressway without a passenger you, you, earns you a ticket. And the money from those tickets will more than pay for the minor administrative costs uh, of this program. And then and on top of that, 
there are some people who lead rather isolated lives, and they, uh, they, don't, they don't know who to ask to be a passenger. So we'll institute a program. This will be a slight additional police cost. Anyone who wants to hitch a ride uh, on the expressway can go to the police station, and they will see if he gets a clean bill of health with someone who never committed a violent crime. And then he gets that clean bill of health, he gets a, a card. And then when he's filming um, rides, when someone stops for him, they'll say, let's see your card. And they, he doesn't have a card, they don't have to pay, they don't have to take him in any case. Uh, people don't want to give a lift to a murderer. Uh, and incidentally, I'm without a computer. I'm uh, without a wife. I'm without a dog. I'm without very many friends. Uh, and my, my mind is often up somewhere. That's why I lost my briefcase with the notes in it. But I managed a year ago to come up with this plan. <clears throat> and J.B. Prisker has not even mentioned global warming in his campaign. Chicago can do a lot, and this is just one example. Okay, now your second question was about the budget or the deficit or something? Yeah. What, you mentioned health care? You want to spend money on solar panels. Oh, yeah. The United States government is broke. Well, I apologize, Charlie. I failed to explain adequately to you the, the miracle of World War II. I'll, I'll repeat and see if you can get it this time. On December the 7th, 1941, unemployment was 10%. The Republicans and the Southern Democrats were hocking a China. That's Yiddish for banging on a tea kettle. Uh, we're hocking a China. The country is broke. Can't spend any more money. And then, as I said, on December the 8th, they woke up. Oh yeah, we found we found uh, 350 billion dollars in the cushions uh, under the uh, couches. The 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 pardon, story. I didn't interrupt you. Pardon. You can speak yeah, after I finish. So as a result of going into debt we became the most prosperous country in history. This is Keynesian economics. There's nothing intrinsically, if, if you can, if you have the credit, you can raise the capital and invest it constructively. And that's what we did in World War II. And that's why we had great prosperity for at least a couple decades after World War II. People had accumulated uh, the war bonds, uh, new industries have been developed. The spending that going into debt for $350 million was the smartest thing we ever did. Now, it's your turn again, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, a question over here? Yes, uh, you know, this, uh, the, you know, it's all wonderful about Casey and economics, but, and, and the whole thing was, in the long run, we're all dead, so it doesn't matter. But the point is that sooner or later there is an end and you have to account for it. Uh -huh. Then what? You uh, destroy the down. currency so and what do something else? So what happened as a result of World War II? Unemployment, uh, uh, I'm going to answer your question. You want to say more? Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I, I'm ready to address the question if you'd like to hear we, my answer. Where are we now? You know, this is this I is can't Kane, see. I, I this is Keynesian economics. That big red bloody thing oh. here is all. Oh. I'm against the military. <laughs> that is a racket. Well, yeah, but it got us out so of the So let, let's too. discuss one subject oh, at a time. Okay. You seem to be correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't, maybe I didn't fully understand. You seem to be saying that if you go into major debt, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, but we've been using it ever since World War II. The you give me more stopped. explanation. What, you want to start over again? I just was asking whether or not that was your essential idea. We, we got out of a depression in World War II because we used Keynesian economics to justify deficit spending. The point is we're still doing it, and we're doing it, and we're doing it, and, we're doing it, yeah. and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where there's just, there, I mean, we can't blow up the world. I mean, if this is the only thing we can do to get out of debt, we're sunk. But I'll tell you what we're not doing, okay? 
We're not doing it for uh, 3,000 homeless veterans, 3,000 homeless children, and 150,000 other homeless people in Chicago. If the CHA took the $300 million they get every year from HUD and built housing, number one, they would create jobs in construction. And then the people who have more settled lives by having a home would be able to organize themselves. I have a perfect schedule of this. I took in, I, just a minute, I didn't interrupt you. I took in a homeless woman about four years ago. She had been homeless for years. And uh, she came to call me daddy and I considered her my daughter. By having a settled place to live, she was able to get herself organized and apply for SSI because she had mental difficulties. And she got her own apartment and her own bank account for the first time in her life. And she's consuming and stimulating the economy. What all she was stimulating when she was homeless on Howard Street was the, the lust of the rapist and the, the, the desire of the cops to give a, a, a attractive black women a hard time. So that's my answer. Is she question. paying down our debt? I'm sorry, what? Is she paying down our national debt? <coughs> you know who paid down the national debt completely? Do you know? Well, you know what? I mean, or, you, either you know or you don't. Our deficit, would you like our to deficit, hear? Would you like to hear? No, China. You don't want to hear. All right. You seal up we, your ears. I'm going to tell the I'm going to tell the rest of the people here One the president time. the president who paid down the national debt. Nobody knows who it was. He paid it Clinton. completely. Clinton. Andrew Jackson. And guess what happened at the end of his recession? The term doing that. We had a major depression. There's paying off the national debt. Uh, question. I think here. I, I missed the point. What's the purpose of boiling the chicken? Of boiling the chicken? To make chicken soup and have consumable chicken. Chicken soup is a big deal in the, in the Russian Jewish households. A, a, a chicken every Shabbos is just the thing to eat, nothing else. You can eat your pills of fish during the week. Uh, and uh, I have very fond memories. Of, my mother's cuisine, it was fantastic. Well, it's an improved economy. What? What does it have to do with economy? Oh, what does it have to do with it? What I was talking about was how people got together in World War II to support the war effort. And they didn't have to pass a law to get my mother religiously, every Shabbos, to take a can, a can of chicken fat to the butcher, who then turned it into the government, would then turn it into explosives. She was helping the war effort. Everybody was helping the war effort. There were very few real slackers. Well, the guys on the black market were trying to take advantage and make a buck. But that's what I, the point I was making. Hooray for chicken fat. Yeah, hooray for chicken Very good, thank you. Yeah. You said that unemployment was 10%. It was actually 25%. It was not 10%. Wait, wait. The unemployment. You're talking about the December Great Depression. The, the Great Depression. No, no, no. Let's take one. The Great Depression started around 1930. Yeah. Roosevelt. Roosevelt uh, was campaigning in 1933. Yeah. I know. Uh, 32. Or, yeah, yeah. Which was a great year. You know why? I was born in it. Okay. Okay. Well, let me finish it. Okay. Uh, if you want to say more, go ahead and say more. Yeah. Well, I'm saying you said the unemployment level when Roosevelt came in was 10 percent. No, I didn't say that. Oh, I thought that's what okay. you said. That's when Roosevelt came in, unemployment was more like a third. And even people in Evanston and Wilmette, the whole economy up there were suffering. Uh, and uh, starting, starting in 1933, uh, Roosevelt started putting through all of the new legislation, like the WT, WTA and the CCC. And by December of the 7th, I don't know what, you know, unemployment was going down steadily as a result of these Keynesian economic measures, getting the country into terrible debt, except everyone was, more and more people were working. 
Uh, and by December the 7th, 1941, uh, unemployment was 10%. Oh, and by spending another $350 million, they got unemployment down really to zero. Because I said before, 1%, which is what it technically was, means people are changing jobs, going on vacation, uh, taking care of sick relatives, voluntarily uh, leaving a job. And so technically they're unemployed, but anytime they wanted to, they could get a job. My old father, who had been a door-to-door -door salesman in the Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, and Jewish village, uh, the neighborhoods of Chicago, he used to go around door-to-door, a great bigger. And by 1940, not only was he sort of giving out, uh, he, um, he developed cataracts, and maybe his treatment was not as good then as it is now. And he felt he couldn't go around door to door anymore. He got a job in the Chicago Pharmacal Company in 1942, I think, uh, at around 4000 North Ravenswood. He was working as a handyman. He wasn't really particularly handy, but they had to have somebody to screw in the light bulbs. So even he uh, had, had a job. It would be very hard to be refused for a job. They were hungry for people uh, to work. Charlie? Yeah, I don't understand your proposal. The Chinese are producing solar panels cheaply. Uh, are you suggesting we buy them from the Chinese? I wasn't suggesting anything. But I mean, the I, I, goal, I, I, if you're truly concerned I'm about sorry, global ahead, warming, ahead. Ahead. is that people put up solar panels, and I don't care where the solar panels go. I don't care well, if it's made in ten buck too. What's the question, Charlie? Yeah, but are you recommending we buy solar panels from China? Uh, I didn't say a word about that. Well, Do you want me to tell me what I think about that now? Well, yeah. We need oh, solar panels. Okay. Uh, you know they what? Make them I think it needs some big calculation. You know, when you're operating a business, more than a business, you're trying to give employment to your people, but you want to get things cheaply. Things got to balance out. You got to make sure you have enough jobs in the country. You also want to make sure that you get all the equipment you can need as cheaply as possible. And I am not a, a, a great enough business genius to give you an instant answer to that question. I can give an answer to that real quick. Oh, go ahead. Uh, let me answer your question. There's more people employed in the solar industry today than coal, oil, and nuclear combined in America. The solar industry is huge. And in answer to your question, Charlie, where to buy them, we should be putting up solar panels bought from anywhere, all over the world. Exactly. We got well, 12 here. It doesn't well, matter where they're manufactured. Oh, they're all yeah, they're yeah, I'm sorry. saying they got to be made in the United States. Well, well, some will. Well, when we move the factories back, back here, they it will be. It doesn't matter where it's from. In the meantime, get them from China or Germany or wherever. Yeah. Just get started getting off fossil fuels. That's, 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 that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. matter where the panel comes from. All right. I'm giving out, and I need to All right, uh, have yeah, sit down and collect your thoughts, because we're going to rebuttal time here. Oh, oh well, Give our speaker a hand tonight. All right. A lot of good points. Thank you. A lot of good points. It's impressive coming from you. Well, you're really well. Who wants to give a, pre uh, a rebuttal? That, that uh, didn't already give a rebuttal earlier with your main thoughts. You're, you're oh, against against the okay, who, who wants to give a rebuttal? Hold up your hands, I'll take a count. Hello, is anybody paying attention? Okay, two rebuttals, 15 minutes apiece. Four minutes or less. I have a hard time paying attention to details around this. Hey, it took a whooping the other day. Yes, you did. All right. Tonight is the anniversary of the Edmund Fitzgerald singing. Oh, my God. Good lyrics. All right, and then tomorrow is... Sunday. Veterans Day. Very good. The war to end all wars. Except oil wars. We can still fight out oil wars. Um, I forgot my prop over there. 
Anyway, this turned into more of a climate change speak speech again. Who was here last week for the climate change presentation? Was it, I heard it was really good. Yeah. I missed it. I was real. Huh? That's what I heard. And I was I was rail fanning in Springfield, Illinois. They have three train stations. This was pretty clear. In Springfield, our capital, there's Lincoln. Huh? Are you going to say they have to be active? Yeah. One active, but three total. The Union stations were really very impressive. I heard it was in the, the uh, movie by uh, Scorsese. No, who's the other director? I can't hear you. Oh, who, who was the director for Abraham Lincoln? Uh, Cheese. Spielberg. 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 Abraham Lincoln. I heard that. Okay, so um, Charlie was right. Yeah. Our speaker, Mr. Speaker, was wrong. Transportation is the problem because it's oil pollution and oil climate change and oil wars. Coal has many, many, many substitutes. The uh, solar, wind, nuclear, water, God knows Tim's storium, geothermal, geothermal. you got all kinds of stuff for, for waves. So, Oil is a problem because we go to war for oil. We're in seven, we in seven oil wars. Still, at this moment, we're in, you know, I count Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Libya and Syria and Iraq. We're still in, in hot wars. And so anyway, um, you know, it was kind of nice that the Democrats took power in the House because now they're in charge of the money. That's always a good thing to have. And, but, you know, I see a problem, and I was going to show the Chicago Reader. <laughs> if the Democrat Party gets taken over by the gay groups and Black Lives Matters again, there's going to be problems. You got 70% of America is white. It just, it is what it is. You've got to live with yeah. I know we hate white people. I got it. But, <laughs> you know, if the Democrats want to win elections again, they got to stop with the diversity bullshit. Yeah, I need you to order. And kowtowing to Black Lives Matter and all those thugs and the gay groups. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I like those people, but you know, it's not. There, there's so many more important things. There's pollutions. There's poverty. There's income equality. There's Wall Street that's going to ruin the economy again when this bubble breaks. Tell me what you want and I'll whip it up. Do you want to? Wars. Global immigration problems because of oil wars. Anyway, on my magazine, I wanted to show the reader because we have another African American on the cover. And I, I know I'm sounding completely racist, but you know what? Which African Every week now. What's like? Yeah, thanks. I know. Now I'm racist. So I'm Trump. But anyway, so I think the Democrat Party has to. Uh, Cater to the whites if they want to be. <laughs> oh, come on. We're all white people. No, I belong to the human race. I don't know what race you belong to. But if, if, the, if the gay groups in the Black Lives Matter hijack the Democrat Party again, the white, all the whites in the hinterland are going to get pissed off. It wasn't hijacked anywhere. Okay, I'm going to show you a Chicago reader. You don't have to. The party is He's got set up for the right side. Thank you. Know. 15 minutes. Okay, don't, don't Our speaker clap. made an excellent point. If we keep going in that direction, the country will be taken over by, by commies and hippies again. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we, you know, we got to be smart. Yeah, by godless communists. Is sure you do what? I think that might be a good idea. Get those commies and hippies take over. I think that's a good idea. 
Why I think they like already that? have. Now that uh, Mo has put on his tie, sure. I can pay sure. attention to it. So thank you, Mo. Uh, um, you know, this blue wave, the blue wave did happen. And by the way, it's still coming, isn't it? There's still some people who are being... Uh, 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 Georgia and Florida is still recounting these things. So I, we're still on there. We're not sure what happens. It doesn't make any difference what happens. The blue wave is here. The women are here, and those new young voices are here. And they're, it's, it's hard to say exactly what they're going to mean, except uh, did, did everyone see the thing in the, uh, it was on the internet. Uh, do you know what's happening? I think it's on uh, June, uh, December 1st. Do you know what's happening? The stock market is crashing. It's 28,000. Oh, things are great. What happens when it goes 10,000? What if it goes down 10,000? What happens? My vote. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the wealth we thought we had is not there. 401 k It's not there. So if you think you have wealth, uh, I would be careful. And I would be cautious because it's not going to be around. Yeah. And the, the guy no. behind it all, Mr. Trump, he, he, he lies. He's number one liar. He's really good. He's very good at lying. But I don't think he's going to make it another two more years. No, we bought him there. That'd be fun. Thirty hundred, man. Well, if if our if the, our civilization lasts that long, it may not last that long. Uh, <laughs> Now somebody uh, brought up what is fascism and um, what happened in Germany is kind of classic fascism and what happened was the economy was going way down because they had to pay back all the money that they took during the First World War and they had to pay it back, so they kept printing money, printing money, until the point, if you wanted to get a loaf of bread, you have, a, have to have a wheelbarrow of Deutschmarks in order to buy bread. So it went up. And so uh, that was a perfect uh, type of uh, economic setting for fascism. And Mussolini gave the best definition, he says, the corporations completely take over the country. And what happened, there was a meeting between uh, Hitler and Goring and the rest of the top brass of the Nazi party, and the um, economic uh, royalists, as Rosa called them, wanted to know, was, uh, was Hitler really a national socialist? So what he told them was, we had to use that term socialist because most of the people in Germany wanted socialism at that time. So th what happened was he had the Krupps, the steel magnets, you had the Thiessons, and you had I.P. Fardum, the one that makes the chemicals, and you had a lot of other people, very, very wealthy people like the uh, a big land of the state, land of the states, the Junkers. That's when they gave uh, Hitler money in order to in order to put forth fascism, because the country was either going to go socialist or go fascist. So they're the ones that imposed the fascism. In the United States, we have uh, the uh, Koch brothers. They're, that's their actual name. And what, what it is, is there anybody here of Elsa, Elsa Koch? You know who she was? She was a relative of the Koch brothers, and she's the one that made lamps out of people's skins. So the, the Koch brothers have a, what they call the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC. And what happens is they came in the uh, Chicago, I think about five years ago or something like that, oh, yeah. at, at the uh, Palmer House Hotel. And what they done, they wrote out the legislation and they told the politicians to sign it. And so they signed it, and that's how we get the uh, uh, Alec thing. 
was a, which is a form of fascism. So fascism actually comes out of capitalism. It doesn't come out of communism. Communism under Stalin was completely different. So that's what uh, fascism is. And when people talk about fascism and don't give you a definition of it, the chances are we could go back into it if they don't know who is the one that imposes it. Can I give you one, one little no. correction about okay. German finance? Can I, may you I? get the last word. Yeah, you get the last word. You get the last word. The German financial problem was not because, because they were having trouble paying off the money they borrowed in the war. The German no financial problem was that they were having trouble paying the enormous fines for the, their guilt in the war, which is a lie. Yeah, you Russia, Russia was the country that was intervening uh, a thousand miles away from its border in the Balkans. On the, right on the border of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that is what created the uh, atmosphere for the assassination of the Archduke. And we can go into details about what was happening. <laughs> Germany was the most Republican Democratic country in Europe on the, uh, on the eve of World War I. Unlike Russia, where there were persecuted Jews, unlike Ireland, where millions of people were being killed uh, by the British fascists, and no one calls them fascists, this is dear old Queen Victoria, uh, Germany had Jews and socialists in their uh, uh, parliament, and they had a democratic country, and they weren't committing genocide against anybody, unlike the British and the Russians. Thanks. Okay, our next rebutter is up. Looks like Victor went out well. Nature's problem. <laughs> okay, when I was up here before, I mentioned a bunch of things. Um, last week I got cut off because uh, it was three minutes instead of four. Tonight I hope it's four minutes, but um, I'm going to subject you guys to what I was going to do in that final minute. Uh, and also it's uh, completely relevant because we were discussing a, a bunch about the environment and the global warming situation. So, as you know, I've written new lyrics to the national anthem. I call it the resistance anthem. You guys have had an opportunity, many of you have passed out leaflets to get on the uh, website so then you would know what I wrote. But uh, I'm going to punish you anyway with my voice which is not quite as bad as Roseanne Barr's, but it's pretty close. To <laughs> oh, say can you feel the global warming? The environment under a pressure degrading. The deserts increasing and more violent storming require persistence in a task unrelenting. The deniers foul creed, the corporation's greed, convince concerned peoples to act on the need. Oh, say we all work to make our planet less hot. For you know this is true, it's the only earth we've got. Play ball. <laughs> you guys are only the third group I've sung that to. I, I did it for an environmental protest a couple of weeks ago. I, I, I managed to get through it, so without, without screwing it up. I'm not a professional singer. But uh, we were discussing global warming with the remaining time I have. I, I just want to point out to Mo that uh, Obama, um, during his uh, eight years, we had a tremendous increase in wind farms, um, and whether you can pick out some quote that he might have made that you know you can, you know, uh, split hairs about uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, I, I'm going to defend Obama on this one. I didn't take a lot of notes during your talk, but uh, I just did want to uh, um, throw out that uh, here we have a situation. Um, we have somebody, we have a, a party basically that's totally in denial 
and wanting to uh, just continue with these fossil fuels. And uh, regardless of whether our government is letting us down, I mean, we should act ourselves. And I, I'm guilty too. I mean, here I have been um, in activism in the big picture, as it were. And, and I probably should be buying solar panels and having them put on my house. And I'm in fear of just the fact that, you know, living in Indiana, a red state, they've probably got obstacles. But, uh, I'm going to have to look into that uh, because we do have this problem. Uh, as I pointed out, I don't know what the Democrats are going to do. And by the way, we've got to be vigilant, certainly between now and January 4th, of a possible Reichstag fire or starting a war. Trump could get into uh, uh, some kind of a hissy fit with Iran. Uh, he could re redo the uh, belligerence against North Korea out of the blue, uh, or out of the red, as the case may be, uh, because, because of the blue wave. Uh, in any case, uh, I'm about out of time. At least I've been running my stopwatch here, so I don't get uh, caught short. That's all right. Go ahead. But um, what we need to do is uh, all stick together. Um, everyone needs to step up their game. Um, everyone needs to be part of the resistance, um, and there are several levels of it. And uh, uh, I have I've run into uh, like people like. Uh, uh, Jan Schakowsky at rallies, and uh, she has told me that she's part of the resistance, and I've said, well, I understand you can't go quite as far as some of us on the left, and, but that when it becomes a real crisis, we'll need you to step far further. So um, we have to hope that our Democratic friends that are with us in spirit, it may not be in the entire Democratic Party, that uh, uh, if something does happen in the way of a crisis, um, that we all stick together and that uh, uh, we defend our civil liberties and that we repel any attempts to uh, uh, start something that could lead to uh, a real true crisis and not just you know, the possibility of a constitutional crisis with uh, uh, this new attorney general and stuff, which is great. Luckily, we did have a few thousand come out on that rally uh, on Thursday night. At which, uh, I must say, uh, top my own horn, I did sing the first stanza of this resistance <laughs> anthem in front of 500 people oh, wow. <laughs> after the crowds diminished. It. And, it was, and it was warmly received. So I wish you'd all get on the website and get with it. Uh, what we want to do is try to have more creative things that, incur that uh, encourage and inspire people for the resistance. Already? What do you say, Weinberg? You got to sit there and listen to him. Use the full uh, microphone, but this guy was yeah. using it. No, we did. I think the battery went out on the mic. Just go ahead and speak to the audience. Just your Let's have a little quiet, please. Yeah, the best definition of fascism is um, nationalism on three doses of steroids. Uh, I cannot define it otherwise. Uh, we were supposed to be talking about elections today, right? Yeah. What happened? I don't know. That's why I wore this button. I voted. And you guys, not one of you have noticed that. Uh, let's talk about it. There is one place in there that really didn't go well with me. And this was brought up back in on Lincoln Avenue. It says, vote for one, and there is only one. How can it be? I mean, it's like some kind of, I would rather have, like some countries have it. It's a vote for one. And they give you another three choices, but there is a small leather note that says, if, if you don't vote for me, you are a low life loser and ask too many questions, stupid questions. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And, and in other countries, like Russia, and I'm not pulling your leg, I'm from there, uh, during Stalin era, they give you a choice, Stalin, one, two, three, 
And there was a small little lettering again, says, if you make the wrong choice, there's gonna be a knock on the door at midnight. Oh, come on. So, okay, the, uh, just to conclude, the last time, I don't know how you, I think I spoke a little bit harsh ab about uh, po overpopulation and uh, reproduction. Um, I think family has its place, reproduction has its place, usually in the bedroom, but it has its place. And, and, and the reason I was saying that, you know, eventually we'll have to tax it is because from 1900 to about 2000, the population was going this way. You see, this is the billions and this is the decades. 1900 here, it was going like this. And then by 2000, it started going like that, and bingo, we reached seven billion. Yep. And we are not in this trajectory anymore. We are in this trajectory. So in another two, three decades, there will be another billion in here, yep. theoretically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So taxation on reproduction would be should be legal, don't you think? It's justifiable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who's next on the vote? Oh, my. Yeah, for the third time. Okay. Oh, he's mm -hmm. complaining about the. Uh, one quick note before. Uh, Marriage. One quick note, everybody. Uh, the waitress informed me, the manager said they got a party of 30 coming in here tomorrow morning, and the bus boys have to set up for it. So we have to be out of here by quarter to nine because the restaurant closes at nine. So right after we sit, uh, the bowl wraps up around 20 to nine. We have to move to the back and get out of here by quarter to nine. Everybody hear that? Yeah. We can't congregate around here like we used to. All right, go out the, no, uh, go out the, or the other side. Congregate out there, but if all right. Get out, out back. All right, well, first of all, let me talk about Victor and one candidate on the ballot there. Uh, one of the major things at the Independent Voters of Illinois, the people come and they want their endorsements, and we look at the candidate has put together what is called, what we call a viable campaign. It's very difficult to do so. You have to spend a lot of time and effort, fundraising, hire uh, someone. If you if you guys are ready when you're done, I'll wait. No, if, when you're done, I'll wait. Please do. Yeah, we got the courtesy to wait. What is it so important? What is so important? You interrupted that. That you have to interrupt. Honestly. Okay, okay, okay. All right, Charlie. Okay. What is so important, you had a, <laughs> Honestly. Come on One now. All the time. I always All right, I was trying to say that, yeah, and if, if no one puts together uh, the effort, now it's not, it's not easy to get on the ballot, particularly in Illinois. They wanted to keep the lightweights off, and to some degree, I think that's a good idea such as in my district where you had this Nazi guy running for office. And he got 25,000 votes because nobody knows who they're voting for. And there's been, yes, you want to keep the Looney Tunes off the ballot. If you think it's a good idea to have any idiot running for public office, and if you think that's an improvement, I don't know about that. Because you're going to get some real lunatics in, in positions of government and authority and with your signing officials. Now the other thing I'll switch to, being eclectic, is that you ought to try this. I did this with the presidential campaign. Just take one issue and see what each of the candidates has to say about it. But wait, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Getting back to getting on the ballot. I've told this story before. Like, how did the Greens get on the ballot? And for years and years and years, we were told, oh, you're going to be a spoiler, you're going to be a spoiler, take away votes from this candidate and enable Republicans to win and so forth. But the Greens got tired of listening to that. And in order to, to get on the ballot, they had to put together 50 state parties, which in fact, I was amazed, they in fact did. Now, I came to Illinois, 
and I was even at the meeting, and they said, well, we have to get on the ballot, and there's very strict rules. You can only, at the time, collect signatures to keep lightweights off the ballot for something like 30-day period. In Illinois, in order to get our presidential candidate on a ballot, I remember at this meeting, there were five of us, and they said, we'll need 60,000, well, all together to be safe, 60,000 signatures. I said, that should be no problem. That's only 12,000 each, which is, I mean, I was being facetious. We, in fact, did it. And not only did we get our candidate on the ballot, but we got ballot status meaning we could designate candidates for the next couple elections. Unfortunately, we didn't, we were unable to sustain that effort, and by that reason, we are no longer at ballot status. I was looking to see if the Libertarians achieved it last time. They had one candidate that they're pretty good. The other thing I was going to get to is I, I took one issue of each of the candidates for president, and I took infrastructure to see what they had to say. Now, amazingly, I heard a derogatory thing about Hillary earlier this evening, but I looked at what Hillary had to say, and I actually found an essay on transportation. And it was very much in detail. It even spoke about projects in Chicago, Illinois. Whoever wrote it up, and it was very, very good, and good analysis. This is the situation and what you plan to do. I then, we tried to ascertain what Trump said, and the only thing we could find was that a quote in a newspaper. He said, oh, I'm going to spend a billion dollars. Um, now, as it turns out, right after the election, no, no time, no, no way. I'm sorry. There are sorry. people behind you. No. There are people waiting to speak. Can you raise your Oh, really? All right. We're, we're, we're All right, I'll let you go. You guys go. Wait a minute, what did I finish up with? Um, Make a big move. Come on. Yeah. Uh, All right. All right. All right. See this? He's made in China. See this? Made in China. Okay. Okay. So JP Krisker, Rauner. No, we got to wait for this. What kind of choice is there? One billionaire, another billionaire. You know, we need some normal people, like working people. Why? And the only way to do that is by getting in the streets and protesting. And everybody has to come to the protest at 2 o'clock on every Saturday at the Logan Square. And if everybody comes, you come, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you all of you. Raise your right hand if you want to come. What come on, come on, what? raise your hand. I can't protest what? What are they protesting for you? You name it, we protest. <laughs> okay. All right, does this thing work? No. 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 Okay, no. all right, she's there for show. All right, uh, first of all, uh, I, I didn't I didn't get to attend the lecture tonight, but you know, in the tradition of the College of Complex, I'm not gonna let that stop me from giving a rebuttal speech on it. <laughs> Um, I, I guess Mo, Mo Shanfield was speaking about the elections. I, what I really wanted to no, respond to was what Charlie said. Charlie's talking about the virtues of making it difficult for people to get on the ballot. I strongly disagree with this. Uh, you know, I actually much, in Illinois it is very, extremely difficult to get on the ballot. Uh, I used to live in Tennessee, and in Tennessee it's much easier. Um, uh, I almost ran for Congress in my home district of Tennessee against um, against Marsha Blackburn. Uh, I chose not to. I considered myself a candidate of last resort. And so I, when I found out somebody else that another Democrat was running, I decided to to support his campaign instead, since I considered myself the least qualified candidate. And um, the uh, anyway. I didn't need that many signatures. I needed like 20 signatures on the petition or something like that. It wasn't that many. And uh, and, and I got the petitions together and everything. I was going to do it, and then I heard that somebody else was in the race, and so I stopped. Um, so but here, here it's just ridiculously difficult, and um, and it's really set up. It's really set up to pre to to maintain this kind of two-party duopoly of the Democrats and Republicans, and. 
You know, most countries, most democratic countries in the world have more than two parties. Um, and, and there's no reason why, and the United States has had more than two major parties in the past, too. There's no reason why we couldn't again, except that the two parties want to maintain their grip on power. We need to put pressure uh, on the politicians, whoever they are, to open up the electoral process and, and allow, make it easier for people to run for office and have more, have more political parties. I think that I think that that would make us a more democratic society, and I say that even in spite of the fact that I'm, I'm actually a Democrat, but I'm a Democrat because it's the only way. Right now, it's either the Democrats or the Republicans. Um, anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Uh, hi. Okay, maybe that doesn't work. Okay, um, I was just looking up fascism in the dictionary. Uh, fascism in the dictionary. It says, uh, this is Merriam Webster. It says, a political philosophy, movement, or regime, such as that of the fascisti, um, that exalts nation and often race above the individual, and that stands for a centralized autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation, and forcible suppression of opposition. So That's I thought that I might said. be That's useful. I and I would like to say, I think Don has a point that um, Don and I and some other people were trying to um, get um, some judges just on the ballot. We're trying to collect signatures. Right. And I mean, it wasn't like uh, these people were support, you have to support these judges or whatever. We're just trying to get them on the ballot. and. We, uh, it, almost no one wanted to sign it. Um, so we're standing out in cold, wet, miserable weather. I think this was last spring or so, trying to do that. So um, it does seem very hard to get um, people on the ballot, though I'm not, I'm not sure what I think the correct amount should be. Um, I am very glad that the Democrats took the House. Um, I think that if they didn't take the House, God knows what would have happened, but I think our health, Obamacare would have been in jeopardy. Um, and um, God knows what else. They, you know, maybe they try to um, cut entitlements and, and other care. things. Um, affordable. So yeah, unaffordable. I, I was yeah, happy to see them get elected. One pool at a time. No mic. Oh, that's right. Thank you. All right. Well, all I have to say is, with regard to those third-party people out there, who are so desperate for are so desperate for third parties. Third parties exist for one purpose. They exist for electing Republicans to public office. Yes. Plain and so. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole reason why they're, we, it's so difficult to get a third party on the ballot is because the elder Mayor Daley saw to it that legislation was passed <coughs> in Springfield to make that very difficult. <coughs> and all I have to say is thank you, Mayor Daley. Yeah. Oh. 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 Hey. Hey. Third party is for one choice. Okay, in a couple He's minutes, our speaker will be coming up. Just the same. Hey, Mo. They're no different. Hey, ask Mo if he wants to give yeah. a, a, a summary. Yeah. In a couple minutes. Does he want to give a summary? No. No. Not really? Okay, we'll, we'll wrap it up in the next five minutes here and then move out so we can be out of here by quarter to nine. It's 25 to right now. So uh, start gathering your things together and get ready to move out there. Uh, in about 20 to nine.